All right. Um, I'm very excited to be giving this talk today, partially because I love Dazzle and partially because I love science. Um, I will say that I'm quite nervous. And the reason that I'm so nervous is that the stuff that I'm going to share with you, with you today is potentially dangerous for me to share. Um, it's potentially detrimental to my career because it's something that people discriminate against with high frequency. But before I get there, I'm actually going to go ahead and just emulate Evan here. Um, Evan spoke a little bit about the draw a scientist test where children are asked to draw what they think a scientist looks like. And although I was never asked to do this, I can tell you exactly what my picture would have been. It would have been a stick figure of a man with a ponytail, glasses, and a mustache. And it inevitably would have been holding hands with a cute little girl. And the reason for that is that's how I draw my dad. This picture is from circa 1994, before he had the full ponytail, but he's had it ever since. And my dad is indeed a scientist. I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is an actual picture from my house um, taken this year. This is my backyard where we frequently had moose who would eat all of our apples. Um, and these are my parents in Southern Utah. If you have the opportunity, you should go to some of the national parks in Southern Utah, they're spectacular. And actually both of my parents have PhDs in biology. Although my dad is a PI and my mom is a science writer. So if that interests you, you can hit me up later. My dad works with zebrafish, he works on development. And when I was a child in like kindergarten, first grade, I would get pulled out of school in order to go in and do experiments with my dad. And I got to do very cool and important work like holding the timer or feeding the fish or adding marbles to the tank. Um, they used to use marbles as rocks so that the eggs would fall down and the fish wouldn't be able to eat them. And I would steal the marbles and hide them in my shoes. So I still have quite a large marble collection. Um, thank you, NIH funding. So um, what is it like to have scientist parents? Obviously, it puts me in a position um, where I had an in in science very early. I knew that scientists were a thing. And in fact, I'm not sure that I knew before I was about seven. I don't think I knew that there were people who had parents who weren't scientists. I kind of didn't know that it was an option to grow up and not be a scientist. Um, but I think that the number one thing that growing up with science parents actually gave me is my definition of scientists, which is someone who's embarrassing and won't let you get your ears pierced. And I think that this definition actually is really, really essential um, to one of the big advantages that I came into this world with. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about privilege from that perspective, right? I'm privileged from a number of degrees and I feel very lucky to have the advantages that I've had. But I think one of the biggest advantages that I've had is this odd permutation, which is that I always assumed science was normal. And I think normalcy really boosts access. It means that I just have never been afraid of scientists. I've never been intimidated by scientists at all. Um, my dad's chairman for, for a while of his department was Mario Capecchi, who's a Nobel laureate. And not only did I only know him as Mario, I mostly knew him as the guy who would throw Christmas parties and put butcher paper up on the wall so the kids could draw on it. Um, so I just didn't have any like fear. I didn't, I didn't hold them up as some magical, white-coated, super smart people. I just assumed everyone was super smart and, uh, and interested in you as a kid who wanted to talk to them about science. Um, and so I actually am really quite passionate about the idea of sharing privilege. I think that privilege should not be, it should not be a bad thing. It should just be a common thing. It should be something that you strive to give to everyone. Everyone should have the advantages that I've had. Um, so one of my big goals is actually to spread normalcy. I want people to look around and be like, oh, that person could be a scientist, and that person could be a scientist, and that person could be a scientist, because I think it makes it, it makes it that much easier for any given kid to decide that this thing that they're really passionate about, science, is something that they can actually pursue. That it's not just some far-fetched, weird dream where it's all, you know, like, nerds and math equations, although we are all nerds. I do make my undergrads do all my dilutions because I don't like math. Um, I also think that it's important to me to try and use my access. I know a lot of people. Um, 
And one of my big goals is to get them in touch with one another so that people who don't necessarily have those connections are able to reach out, which is why I'm dead serious when I say, if you are interested in non-PI careers that are also non-biotech, like hit me up, email me, I'll get you in touch with my mom. You, you know, I want people to have this, this access. Um, and the last thing is I think that we all can do a little bit of a better job using our get out of jail free cards. I can get away with almost anything, um, partially because I just look goofy. And I think it's actually something that I've been trying to do this year is like make enemies on behalf of other people so that they don't have to, so that when they step in and ask for something, it will look reasonable because I got there first and asked for something ridiculous. Um, I don't know how to say it better than that. Anyway, so I also want to talk a little bit about passing privilege, which is also something that I am privileged to have. I look Christian, I look healthy, and I look straight. I am none of those things. And that's an advantage because, for example, um, I, only 2% of the United States is Jewish. I'm one of that 2%. But over 58% of all religious hate crimes are against Jews. So the fact that I don't necessarily look Jewish is actually a protection for me. Um, I look healthy, which I am not. More than 25% of all cop shootings um, happen when there's somebody in the room who has an obvious mental illness. And so I'm lucky that I look healthy, even though I'm not. And I've never had to worry about whether someone was going to beat me up for liking women because I like both men and women and because I'm married to a man. And so I look straight. So these are all things that are protections and privileges, but they are also actually, like they come with a caveat. And the caveat is isolation. It is unbelievably lonely to feel like no one ever really sees you, to feel like nobody can ever really um, identify who you are. And it can it put you in situations where you get left out, right? I don't get invited to, um, to the various gay science clubs because I look straight. And that's okay, because it is still a privilege, but it also opens up the biggest thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is it opens up a real danger when it comes to hidden disabilities. So I have a hidden disability. Um, when I was in high school, I started feeling entirely empty, just entirely numb. And I started having like almost so much a disconnection from the world that I almost started hallucinating. And I would start to see things like, my skin you know, peeling back or like walls cracking. It was really terrifying or it would have been terrifying if I could feel anything, but I couldn't. Um, I'm very, again, lucky that I was able to talk to my parents about this, that they were able to help me see a doctor. Um, and I am now, uh, you know, I am now on medication that allows me to live my life relatively normally, but I still get sick. I still get really sick sometimes. And it's not something that we talk about. It's something that we dismiss all the time. I was recently re-diagnosed with bipolar disorder rather than psychotic major depressive disorder. Um, and I felt really lucky. I felt lucky because we dismiss depression so much that I was like, people will believe me now that I'm sick. My symptoms didn't change, but my diagnosis did. And I think that's really sad actually, to be constantly afraid that people won't believe that, that you need help. So um, it's very common for us to dismiss mental disorders, but they have severe health implications. And I do wanna point out that suicide is actually the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And it's the second leading cause of death for almost everybody under the age of 35, which means that objectively last year when I had an episode when I got sick was much more dangerous than this year during a pandemic for me. So, um, I guess I wanted to try and be open about this. It legitimately puts my career in jeopardy, right? Like I, I was on the admissions committee at one point. And at one point I remember a faculty member behind me started just speculating about whether someone had taken a year off from science due to having a mental breakdown. Um, and I think that's pretty common for people to worry about that or to think that you can't be an incredibly brilliant and engaging scientist and important figure in the community or, you know, a politician or a doctor or whatever it is, if you are sick, like I'm sick, but you can. So um, if you need help, I highly recommend that you seek it. 
because there are resources out there that are designed to help you. If you ever want to talk to someone, you can hit me up. Um, I would love to talk to you. And you need to remember, if you're sick like I'm sick, that you can do it. Because I went to a fantastic liberal arts school and I did a thesis in my undergrad on peripheral nerve development. We've got these docal mutants and zebrafish here where their nerves do not reach out all the way into their musculature. I wrote another thesis on sleep and death in Henry IV part two, which is a Shakespeare play because I minored in English literature. And all of that allowed me to get to grad school, allowed me to come to San Diego here where I joined the lab with Kim Cooper. And here I started working on mammals. Now something has happened to this slide and some of these pictures have disappeared, but I hope you can appreciate that there is a wide diversity of mammals. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And while that's just inherently cool because I love going to the zoo and I was devastated when the zoo was shut down during early part of the pandemic, um, it's also actually really interesting from a developmental and evolutionary standpoint. If you look at even just one part of a mammal, like for instance, the limb, you can tell how dramatically different they are between species. And that difference is cool, but it also is functionally relevant because the kinds of shapes that you have inform the behaviors you can engage in. And that totally changes the evolutionarily, or sorry, ec ecological niches that you can be part of. So for example, this is a mouse that's able to navigate its environment in part due to the, um, the form of its limbs, which allow it to functionally grip these interesting thistle plants. And it moves very different than its cousin, which we study in our lab, the lesser Egyptian jerboa. I hope you can appreciate that the jerboa actually moves much more like a horse than it does like a mouse, even though it's closely related to the mouse. And that's a function of those long hind limbs convergently having the same form as the horse limbs. They're very thin, they've got really strong tendons, they've lost muscle. I told you that mice and jerboas are closely related. They're actually sister groups. They're about 55 million years divergent. They're much more closely related than kangaroo rat, for instance, which actually has a less extreme morphology. And they're certainly more closely related than, say, bats, which I think of as flying rodents, even though they are not rodents at all. Bats are more closely related to dolphins than they are to mice. Um, so what we have here with the jerboa is a combination of something that has an extremely divergent morphology and an extremely similar genome. And that allows us to ask two big questions. How do mammals make limbs in general? And also, how do you change those instructions over the course of evolution in order to create divergent forms? Unfortunately, it is not easy to study a non-model organism. I don't know how many of you are trying it right now, but it's not always fun. Um, and so the thing that I've been working on throughout my thesis is actually ways of using model organisms to study non-model organisms. I can't believe how many aspects. I apologize to you all if this used to have a mouse here. The point is, I can make a genetic model in a mouse um, that has jerboa limbs. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to make a genetic model of a mouse, um, that would be a, you know, a jerboa, you'd wanna know what kind of genes are important in that phenotype. But unfortunately, I don't know if you noticed its forelimbs, but the forelimbs of the lesser Egyptian jerboa are actually very similar to those of a mouse. Um, and unfortunately, most of the genes that pattern your forelimbs and your hindlimbs are completely identical. And that means that you can't really change protein coding genes and expect to get changes just in those hind limbs, or at least that can't explain all of the difference. And so I think a big part of the difference is actually regulatory. So if I gave you all bricks and told you to build houses, you could build some really dramatically different shapes depending on how many bricks you used and where you used them and for how long. And the same, of course, is true with regulation and coding. So the same protein used in a different place can result in a different outside phenotype. Unfortunately, Enhancers, which are, you know, one of the most common regulatory regions we talk about in science, are actually almost always redundant. And that means that if I'm trying to make a genetic model of a jerboa, I'm going to have to use multiple regions, multiple regulatory regions for multiple genes in order to create the complex phenotype that you see. 
And that's very difficult to do because genetics in mouse is very time and labor intensive. If I cross two mice that are triple heterozygotes, I've got a 25% chance of getting a homozygote for any of these genes, less than a 2% chance of getting a triple homozygote. In other words, if I do that cross, I would need to screen 146 offspring to have a 90% chance of finding just one triple homozygote mouse. And that makes it virtually impossible for me to make a model of a complex phenotype like a Jerboa limb, right? That where I might need to combine many different genes and maybe many different regulatory regions for each gene. But what if you could get around Mendel? What if instead of a situation like this where a gray mouse and a black mouse produce a heterozygote mouse that has a black phenotype, what if you have a copycat gray gene? When it's inherited, it copies itself to the opposite chromosome. You have a homozygote in the first generation and you'd have your phenotype in the first generation. That would make everything much easier. It would make it actually practically possible for me to combine all of these different genotypes together and make a model organism that looked like a Jerboa. This is actually possible through, um, through a technology that's called either active genetics or gene drive. The idea is that if you put all of the machinery that's necessary and you encode it into the genome, so you've got Cas9 and guide RNA encoded in the genome, their gene products go together, make a cut on the opposite chromosome, and that cut can either be healed by non-homologous end joining, frequently leading a mutation, or the regions of homology lining up on either side can result in the copying of that allele to the opposite chromosome, producing a homozygote. And that's homology-directed repair. This works very, very efficiently, actually, in both flies and mosquitoes, but it had never been done in a vertebrate before, and we wanted to try it. And so we chose to target tyrosinase, which is the gene that makes melanin. Um, it's the rate limiting step in making melanin. We used a cassette that included a guide RNA that targeted tyrosinase and an mTERI. This copycat gene interrupts tyrosinase and makes an albino mutant, and also it fluoresces red. When it's crossed with a normal wild-type mouse, absolutely nothing happens. Guide RNA is expressed everywhere, but guide RNA on its own is not very useful. However, if this wild-type tyrosinase mouse also carries a gene that encodes Cas9, then the Cas9 and the guide RNA can get together, and potentially you can end up with a copying event and a white mouse in that first generation. Now, if that does happen, it's very difficult to tell the difference between these two chromosomes, between the original one and the recipient chromosome. So one thing we did was that we included a hypomorphic allele, just a SNP in tyrosinase, it's called chinchilla, and it makes a gray mouse. Um, and that way we can always tell the difference between the allele that originally had that guide RNA and the one that received the copied version. Um, so, the first thing we did was we compared two Cas9s that are expressed in early embryonic stages. And so I want you to remember that without a mutation or copying event, you should only ever see a black or a gray mouse. I hope you can appreciate that there are some pretty obviously white mice in these litters. Um, and interestingly, with a different Cas9, H11 Cas9, we saw something different. We saw mosaic mice. This was very, very consistent actually. In the rows of 26 Cas9 mice, they always looked white if they inherited both the Cas9 and the guide RNA. And in the H11 mice, they almost always looked mosaic. Unfortunately, that actually doesn't tell us whether there was a copying event or whether a mutation was made, because either way you would end up with white mice. So in order to determine what had really happened there, we had to back cross them to albino mutants. And then we followed the chinchilla marked chromosome, that's the recipient chromosome that something happened to, um, to find out what was really going on. There's three possible options with that chinchilla marked chromosome. Either you end up with a gray mouse, meaning nothing happened, or you end up with a white mouse, meaning there was a non-homologous end joining mutation that was created in that chromosome, or you end up with a white and red mouse, which can only happen if that cassette with the guide RNA was copied across to the chinchilla marked chromosome. Now, unfortunately, when we looked at the numbers, none of them had copying events. All of them had really strong mutations that were made. And that was actually surprising to us because the common way that you make knock-in alleles is by using homology-directed repair in the zygote, which is about the time period when we were doing this. So we were like, 
Why did we only get non-homologous end joining when lots of people are able to see homology directed repair? But the difference is, if you are trying to make a knock and mutant, you inject in Cas9, guide RNA, and thousands of copies of template. The only template that can be copied from or to in our experiment is the other chromosome. There's just one copy. And that means that the likelihood of alignment is just really, really low in our scenario because mm -hmm. homologous chromosomes are not aligned in somatic cells. So usually when we draw cells in biology class, we like to draw homologous chromosomes lined up together. But that, of course, is completely false. The average somatic cell just looks like spaghetti. The average mitotic cell looks like it has aligned chromosomes, but you have to remember those are sister chromatids. Those are not homologous chromosomes that are lined up with one another. The only time you actually get homologous chromosome alignment in a somatic cell in a, ma in a mammal, I guess, is never in a somatic cell. It's only in a meiotic cell. Because during meiosis, those homologous chromosomes line up and they actually perform exchanges of information similar to what we're asking them to do. So we produced a mouse that would have guide RNA expressed everywhere, Cree expressed exclusively in the germline, which could excise a stop so that Cas9 would be expressed exclusively in the germline. That way, in most of the mouse, nothing happens, but in the germ cells, you potentially have that cut and potential copying. The somatic cells should just be heterozygous, but the germ cells might actually have copying events. Again, we did that outcross to determine what had happened, and again, you can have either a gray mouse, which means that chinchilla chromosome had nothing happen to it, a white mouse, which means you had a non-homologous end joining mutation, or a white and red mouse, which means that there was actually a copying event. In the male germline, we saw lots of non-homologous end joining disruption, but no homology directed repair. But in the female germline, although there still was non-homologous end joining disruption, we did see copying. We saw homology directed repair converting that chinchilla mark chromosome so that it actually now carried the guide RNA and the M cherry cassette. And we saw it at pretty high frequencies. In our H11 females here, 44% of those chinchilla mark chromosomes were converted to, be, um, to, to carry our trans gene. And that means the total amount of trans genes being inherited in the next generation went up from 50% to 72%. We think that the difference between the female germline and the male germline phenotype that we saw comes down to timing. Basically, you have, about, you have bipotential gonads when you're at about E10. And then if you're going through oogenesis, the oocytes initiate meiosis almost right away at about E13.5. In contrast, spermatogenesis is fully mitotic for a really long time until well after birth. You only go into meiosis at about P7 or P8 if you're a male. And so our gene was being expressed, basically our Cre was turning on Cas9 expression at about E15 and more or less was turning on expression at a time when oocytes were meiotic and when spermatocytes were mitotic. So effectively what happened was chromosomes were only aligned in the female. And we think that if you could really target the timing of Cas9 expression closer to meiosis in male, you might be able to get this to work in male and female. In either case, with our results just in the female, initially I told you that if you had a triple heterozygotes and you crossed them together, you need 146 offspring. With our results, you'd only need 48. It's a massive decrease in the number of mouse animal lives that you'd have to sacrifice, and also in the amount of time, energy, and money that you'd have to put into an experiment in order to combine three different alleles together in a single animal in a homozygous state. Recent work by my colleague Alec Weitzel actually indicates that copying can be achieved in the male as well, as long as you time it really precisely. And this potentially opens up um, an opportunity for us to really uh, combine many alleles together and understand evolution in a really fundamental way. I also want to point out that by definition our experiment caused two closely linked alleles to be combined together. Our guide RNA insertion site was an exon 4. The chinchilla SNP that we used to mark the chromosome was an exon 5. The normal recombination rate between these two is 4.7 times 10 to the negative fifth. But we saw recombination between 20% of the time. And that would allow you to make mouse models that literally would be impossible otherwise between closely linked genes that are on opposite chromosomes. With this technology, you can combine them together onto the same chromosome. So in summary, 
we really don't think early embryonic expression of Cas9 can be used to make copies um, because all that's happening there is non-homologous end joining. But germline Cas9 expression really does induce copying. And we think meiosis is the critical factor. Really having those chromosomes aligned is what allows you to copy information from one to another. And this technology has the potential to aid in making genetic models of evolution, but I will also point out genetic models of disease, right? Many, many diseases are multigenic. Heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, most mental disorders. Um, and so it's possible that this kind of technology could actually improve the ability for biomedical researchers to produce mouse models of complex diseases. So with that, I wanna thank you all for listening. It's been um, a privilege to talk to you today. I wanna to thank my PI, Kim Cooper, who's absolutely incredible, and the entire lab, but especially Angela, Alex, and Andrew, all of whom worked on this project at some point in their careers. Um, I wanna thank my co-authors and my committee and our funding, but I especially wanna thank my moral support network. The single best thing that I have in my life is the people around me. I am unbelievably, unbelievably lucky to have an incredible partner who cares for me, to have an incredible set of fuzzy um, family members who have completely changed my life, and to have truly just superb friends and family. I'm beyond lucky, through the roof. So thank you all for listening. I happily would take questions.